Been in just a few moments, but before we begin, here are a few reminders. For the comfort and safety of those around you, remain seated during the presentation, keeping your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the theater. And please, supervise your children. Permanecer sentados, por favor. Eating and drinking are permitted, but we do ask that you deposit your trash in the bins provided as you leave the theater. As a courtesy to our presenters and everyone else in the theater, refrain from flash photography and turn off or silence your cell phones. Also, we ask that there be no texting during the presentation. The texting lamp is out. And now, stage 23, as part of our celebration of 60 years of Walt Disney Imagineering, is pleased to present the craft of creativity. Please welcome your host, the president of Walt Disney Music, Chris Montan. today because we have six incredibly accomplished and creative people who oversee all our parks and resorts and I'm fortunate in the job that I have which is I'm in charge of music for the company but I get to work with them every day and rather than talk about what they do which is take care of all of you greatly I think we're going to talk a little bit about how they got here and when I mentor people and stuff they always go well how do I get be an Imagineer, or how do I get to be a composer, or how do I get in this Disney thing? And there's no path. Because if you want to be a doctor, you get a med medical degree, and there's things you can follow. If you want to be a lawyer, same thing. To become head of a theme park, it has a very varied kind of experiencing path, and, and all of them are going to share those stories with you today. So let me bring them out. Uh, first, uh, Let's see. We have Joe Lance Cicero, who is a creative leader for Hong Kong Disneyland Resort, as well as all the Disney Cruise Lines. future Disney Vacation Club properties. He also oversees all our design efforts as they relate to attraction and entertainment safety around the globe. And next we have Kathy Mang, whose 35 year experience um, and her role as executive producer for the overall Walt Disney World portfolio with direct creative leadership over at Disney's Hollywood Studios and Epcot. Is that correct? Okay, a slacker at only 25 years is Daniel Chu, who oversees the entire Tokyo Disney Resort in Japan. Oversees Disney's Animal Kingdom and Walt Disney World, which includes the upcoming Avatar expansion as well as the Alani, a Disney resort and spa in Hawaii. And then last, now see how many years of time. Okay, 35 years, is Tom Fitzgerald, who's the creative leader of both Disneyland Resort here and Disneyland Paris in France. So let me start with you, Joe. Well, we talked, I interviewed them all, so I know a little bit of their backstories, and I work with them every day. Um, you spent a lot of your growing up years as a performer, musician, animator. How did that inform your ability then to do the eventual job you wound up with? That's a good question. Um, and I think it's probably true for all of us. There's a common theme in, yeah. in most Yeah, I think first and foremost, you got to remember what we do is 
is to entertain. We got to create, whether it's a, a cruise ship or a theme park attraction, whatever, ultimately you people have to feel like you've spent your money and you've laughed, you, you felt something, you were, you were touched in some way. And so having, having been through you know, theater and I was, I'm a musician, I'm a drummer, and, and, and in all those endeavors, a couple things happen. One, you have to always think about the bigger picture of how you're involved in this endeavor. So if you're doing a play or if you're playing in, in a musical um, or in, in a, some kind of musical situation, the whole is bigger than some of the parts. It's always bigger than you. And I think that serves me very well because I always have to think about, you know, in my position, um, I can't, if I fixate on a little detail, I'm not doing my job. I have to think about everything in total and all the big things that are happening and understand my role and then make sure all of the various Imagineers who are working on it understand their role, make sure they understand how important it is but how it fits into the bigger piece. And I think that's true in, if you're doing any <coughs> theatrical experience. You called it knowing your place. Knowing what your place. What did you mean? Yeah. Well, <coughs> um, it's like, you know, you're a musician too, you know, and musicians here. Uh, it's knowing when not to play and knowing when to play. Or if you're in a, in a, th a theater situation, there's five people on stage, there's that time where you're just supposed to stand there and do nothing. And it's important to be able to communicate that to the Imagineers. I mean, sometimes, like, our, our Imagineers are the greatest in the world, and they would love to give you 200% all the time. And that's great, and you want that. But sometimes you've got to be able to explain to them, you know what, 25% is all we need here. You know, I don't need to see all that stuff. And, and for them to understand that and grasp that and see the bigger whole, I think that's key to our jobs. Okay, that's great. Joe R., as we talked to Joe L., you grew up in fairly unusual circumstances in Hawaii and probably could have gone a, a number of different ways in your life. What was the turning point? What made you go on this career path and wind up here? You mean when I started as Imagineer, or what started me in a direction what started that I could be an Imagineer and say a kid, car thief? What was the first thing that you did that actually started you on the road to be here? Yeah, okay, so veering from car thief, um, which could easily have been one of the options available, uh, as I left junior high and started high school, I really was getting in trouble, that's why I was in an all-boys high school. That's why I asked um, I was dared, dared, to my face to do a set for a production of The Tempest, um, which was the right way to enlist me. Uh, and so I did this set for The Tempest, ended up playing Caliban in The Tempest. Um, and that was enough of an introduction into that whole translation of idea to physical thing to keep me moving on a path where eventually I was recruited to come to Imagineering, where again I languished as a troublemaker for some years before I finally found something productive to do. And by doing set design then with basically either no budget or low budget, how did that inform your... Yeah, I... People don't necessarily know this about me, but I am very budget conscious. I care about the budget. I respect the money. I really do believe... I do not believe that the concept is something separate from the means by which you are going to do it. And some of the means by which you're going to do it is how much money you have. It's, it's no different being an artist. I mean, if I want to go paint a picture, just paint a picture. I have to have some piece of paper, and it's some size. And I can't paint a picture that's 14 by 20 if my paper is 5 by 5. So I have no problem with this. I think it's one of the creative tools. I've worked with it all my life. And I have never seen it to be a profound inhibitor to great creative work. Eric, you wanted to work at Disney fairly early. We've had a little interview, so I know a little bit of the backstories. What were your first jobs, and what were the steps you took to actually get a job at Disney? Um, well, I was a front and a back of an animal, I think, that is a story, <laughs> so you want to hear all this. Um, I, uh, I, I went to high school in Fullerton, California, which is right near Disney, Disneyland, of course. And I, I, I always loved Disneyland. We, when I was a kid in Bakersfield, before I moved to Fullerton, we would go once a year, and I just loved it. I, I didn't really think about being an engineer, but I wanted to be a part of that whole thing. So I, I discovered in high school that you had to be 18 to work into the park, 
but if you were 16, you could be hired to be a performer in the parades. So I, in junior high school, I auditioned when I, when I was 15 and a half. I auditioned for the parade, which I would have been 16 then, and was hired at the very end of the audition, basically because I was six feet tall, and I, they thought I could carry a heavy costume and I could march in time to music. So I was hired as a Christmas tree. <laughs> and about two weeks, and about two weeks after I was hired as a Christmas tree, before the rehearsal started, I got a call from the choreographer, and she said, "Somebody's dropped out, and we're going to promote you to be the rear end of a Jungle Book elephant." <laughs> so that was my first job. I was the rear end of a Jungle Book elephant at the back of the last elephant in a, 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 a string of six elephants. And the next year, my senior high school auditioned again, and I was hired to be the front end of Colonel Hattie, the front elephant. So I rocketed forward my career within one year. <laughs> Did it keep going that way every year? You got to do something else. Not every year, but yeah. No, and I, I did many, many parades and many performances in high school, and then later in college went to USC, and I worked there on the weekends. So I had a lot of roles. Um, and, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great time. Great time. Well, and a lot of you guys did attractions before you worked there. And Tom, I know that you did your first attraction, waiting for your interview with Marty Clark. Was that true? Or well, a attraction? I I started at Walt Disney World. I went to school in the Midwest. I grew up in New York, and my introduction to Imagineering was the New York World's Fair. And I was so captivated by the attractions, the Disney attractions especially, and the sort of unique mechanical theater format of riding in cars or boats or traveling theaters. Um, so I decided when I was in school that I would, if I wanted to work in Imagineering, I better go down there and learn how things work. So I went to Florida. Um, I had to lie and say I had a car when I didn't, or they wouldn't hire you. So I hitchhiked to work every day um, for the first summer, and I went back the second summer, and I uh, said, well, it's time to go to California. So I built a model of a Winnie the Pooh attraction. <coughs> time saying, gee, it's amazing we don't have a Winnie the Pooh ride in Fantasyland. Then I threw it in the car and drove to California. I got an interview with Marty Sklar, and he hired me on the condition that I never build another model in my career. <laughs> so it really was pretty awful. But he liked the ideas that were in there, and, and that became what he called the calling card that got me started. I had a drink with Marty last night, and he was so proud of that story. He told me the whole thing. He said, I saw something in Tom, it was the worst thing I've ever seen, but I, I could see the idea was great. And I said, I'll hire you if you never make an attraction again. So I thought that was kind of cute. <laughs> Kathy, what was your first job? And what made you think that you wanted to work in Disney? Um, not unlike Eric, actually. I, I grew up just down the street from Disneyland. I grew up in the city of Orange and needed a summer job to go to school. In college, and so I applied at Disneyland. So my first job um, was I worked in Adventureland in the Adventureland Bazaar and the Tropical Imports Hut, or a Moo Moo, and um, sold shrunken heads that glow in the dark and rubber snakes and plastic legs that were 225, 239 with tax. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I can remember that, and I can't remember what I'm doing tomorrow. But um, so that was my first job. It was a great part-time summer job with a, a great company and, and I was in school with an in, getting an English degree, or a, a, an English major and didn't know what I was going to do with it and went to Disneyland and said I've got an internship, I can get three units of upper division work if I do something for you, do you need any writing done? And Disneyland had some manuals and things that they needed written so I started writing and going to school um, at night and writing during the day, that, that transitioned into a, actually a full-time job as a writer at Disneyland. And that was it. So I, I, I've been at the company for a really, really long time, but the first four years, I keep saying, really shouldn't have counted because um, I mostly, fl we flirted with the John the Prince boys for four years. I wouldn't say there was a whole lot of value added to the company, but it did launch into a great career. So Danny, when you were a kid, you wanted to be an engineer because you were your dad. How do you go from being an engineer to a theater major? How, what changes in your life that young that makes you go that far? Well, I wanted to be an engineer because that was what my dad did. And I had no idea what an engineer actually did. Right. Um, you know, actually, like in grade school, I, you're supposed to draw where your office and your dad was. And I drew a, a, a train engine because I thought that's what most of did. <laughs> so, um, but 
uh, in high school, I did a stage crew for our theater uh, department and, um, and loved it. And so when it came time to uh, fill in the application for college and it says, you know, what major would you like to, to pursue? Um, I first wrote an engineer, but then I, I started thinking, wow, I, mean, I really don't know if that's, that's, I have any passion for that. So I erased it. And I said, what do I really love to do? And, and, and I wrote theater. So that's why I, I started studying theater at UCLA. And didn't really understand what, what imaginary was. I didn't really know about imaginary. And, and I, I've been to Disneyland, but didn't really know who built Disneyland. And, um, and, and studying theater, most theater students, I mean, they expect to be waiting tables for the rest of their lives. So that's what I expect to be doing. Um, but then um, my, my very good uh, teacher's TA at the time, a uh, very good friend of mine, uh, started working for the Disney stores and, and that's how I, I got my first job. I'm always amazed because when I spend, I've spent my career trying not to worry about budgets and, and just to worry about the music for the company. And these ladies and gentlemen have to deal with millions and millions of dollars and I'm wondering, I, I'd ask you, Joe, what is it about, where, did, where does the confidence come to supervise these incredibly large construction projects and know how to go about it? And you wake up at night and go, oh, God, what, what is that process? <laughs> OK, I um, personally. People may have heard me talk about this before I talk about it. I talk a lot. Talk about this. I really believe that before you take any action at all, any action at all, conceptual, anything, you have to do this hard work on the deepest underlying reason why this work is going to happen at all, which tends to be some kind of philosophical idea. It's not, I want to get it built. It's not even that I want people to have fun. It's like, this idea is about this. What we're really here to do, the real reason we're coming here, the real reason we're doing this project is this idea. Once that idea is clear, it becomes incredibly clear. That's in, that's out, he's good, he's not, she gets it, she doesn't, this is where we're going, that, we'll never afford that, we don't need it because we can do this that we need to do by doing that. Um, and you roll and you roll and you roll and each step you take, it becomes clearer. The other steps are clearer because they, they hang together and they hang together. So pretty soon, I mean, I don't have to do very much except go around going, good job, that's right. <laughs> because it's obviously right. Because so much accumulative harmony has been built up from the idea that you have to be stupid to not understand what the right decision is. It's really clear. Not that every decision that is right is available. Sometimes you literally do have to do something that veers off 15 degrees from the best decision, but you know it. You know it, so you're working around it, right? And to me, this has to do with what appears to be wasting time at the beginning of the project, just talking about it for a long time and not doing anything, right? And then when you get to work, it's very clear. And I believe that I... I, I really do believe when I'm arguing for spending more money, spending less money, uh, that I have a defensible reason why I'm doing that and that, that I can take that to the bank. There's probably some people here that would like to know how you get to one of these jobs, how this whole thing happens. And I would say that, I'll ask Eric first, um, if you were going to grow one of you, what, what do you think the attributes are? What are some of the things that somebody what, what are some of the things you might do and the experiences you might garner to become an imaginator first and then to get to the place where you guys all got to? Wow, that's a really I know it's tough big. question. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, as, as, you're, as being revealed on this panel, all of us, I mean, some of us aspire to work for Disney, aspire to create great things, but you don't go to imaginary school and get the top degree and then you, you get the job. It's For me, it was... Being, it was obviously having a, a degree of talent and a, and a lot of passion, and then having circumstances in the world and in my life that set me, uh, that opened doors. So I was working at Disneyland as a performer, 
And um, I um, and I was an art major at USC. And I, my boss had gone to college with Tony Baxter, and Tony was down at the event building Big Thunder. And so we would have lunch together, and Tony, you know, Tony found I was an artist, and he said, well, if you like to build models, you should apply it at WED, because they're hiring model builders. So that kind of thing happened, and the bicentennial that happened before, which got me um, some more work in the art department and entertainment, and so on and so forth. So if Epcot hadn't happened, the bicentennial, the bicentennial hadn't happened, and then later Disney and Hollywood Studios now, hadn't happened. I don't know if my career would have gone to the path that it did, but doors open, I was available, I was qualified, and so I went there. So it's kind of like that. It's, it's, it's really hard to say, but just stick at it and don't say no to any opportunity. Yes. So, you know, that's a common thing. You know, so the passion I had of not saying, I want to be a parade performer, because believe me, I can't dance, and I, <laughs> and I can barely act, but that idea of the doors open, that I could get in and start learning about the company early was sort of the first key. So, and, I, and a lot of things that come my way like figure finishing and set construction and show quality standards, we call it things that at first I kind of wrinkled my nose and said, what's that about? And I said, well, let's try it. The life is an adventure. Let's go on an adventure and do it. And I learned more and more and more and became more and more versatile. And I know there's similar stories all around the panel. It looked like you had something Well, I just that. think you have to be the kind of person who wants to share. Uh, there is a kind of person who thinks they want to do this because they think when they get where we are, they're going to get to tell everybody what to do. <laughs> uh, that it's their vision, my vision, my idea. It's going to be me, and I get to do it, and everyone will do what I say. And that is just not the job. And it's never the job. At every step of your career, you are moving towards the center of a group of people. But you're never at the top of anything. You're in the, you just move towards the center of a group of people who are all trying to do something. And what that means is, a lot of very generous sharing of knowledge, of power, of intention, uh, in, in order for anything to happen. And not everybody who is an artist wants to be that kind of artist. We mentioned Tony Baxter, who became a legend yesterday. And I think he also, yes, please. <laughs> his help. And I think, Joe, you had some connection with Tony as well. He, was part of your ushering into the company, Absolutely, right? yeah. Um, I had actually, my career path, I wanted to be an animator. And I studied animation at CalArts. And um, straight out of school, went to work as a, as a Disney animator, which was great. Um, found there's there's a personality type. You got There's a certain type of solitary to that work. That you got to be just comfortable sitting at a desk and drawing. This was back in the 2D animation days. You could sit and draw and draw and draw. Uh, maybe some interaction with the director, maybe some interaction with the layout artist or whatever. Um, but like Joe was just saying, I, you know, you got to love people to do this job. And I always loved the energy of being with people growing up in a big Italian family. There's always, you know, lots of people around. And um, I was working actually on some small films for Epcot. I was still in feature animation and got to know. Tony, because um, it was for uh, Journey Through Imagination. I was doing, I was animating some of the figment stuff that was 2D animation. That was part of it. And uh, yeah, I, got, I did a lot of quirky, weird little animation things that ended up in the parks, which was awesome. So I, I met a number of Imagineers, and the energy that I got when I, I went to Imagineering and saw how collaborative it was, um, how, how you know, the, the story guys were there, along with the guy that was going to be building uh, whatever. And I was like, wow, this seems like it's really a lot of fun. And then it just so happened that um, we were going through a strange time in animation, which I won't get into that. Uh, it was kind of the transition from the old guard to the new guard. Um, and so I had been talking to Tony about you know some of my frustrations. And he said, you know, he says, you should put a portfolio together and come over and you know, chill it around. And uh, Tony was great and took it into Marty. And it was literally a week later, I walked from across the street because Future Animation had been exiled from the studio to a, a warehouse across from Imagineering, which was another reason for why I believe, which I won't get into. And, uh, oh, you could. <laughs> there, there was pretty low morale at that time. But so I just literally, on Friday, I packed up all my stuff from my animation desk. and. Walked across the street, and they gave me a piece of plywood sitting next to Joe Rohde, who had, was covered with props, who was building the, um, the Adventurers Club. I go, this is cool, <laughs> and I never looked back. Tom, you started.
start out primarily as a writer first? Yeah. How did you become a filmmaker? And, well, and a lot of kind of nurtured that in you. Um, you know, when, when I first went to college, I went to school in Chicago, and I really wanted to come to California. Of course, I wanted to come to Imagineering. I said, I'm, I'm going to Disney University. And my mom said, after Northwestern. <laughs> so I, I, uh, the first first year in college, I applied to USC Film School, and I got accepted. And my parents said, no, we're going to pay for Chicago. So I stayed in Chicago. So I had a, a fascination with film. But like so many of us here, you never know where your path is going to take you. It's, I remember Alice Davis on one of the panels a few years ago talking about things that we think of, you know, like Small World and Pirates as assignments. You know, think, oh my God, Small World Pirates. You're getting assignments. And a lot of the early things that Marty Sklar asked me to do were writing with media combined. You know, it might have been the Omnisphere for Horizons or, or some other pieces that he would ask you to do. And when the studio tour project was, was going along, Bob Weiss came up to my office and said, hey, I, I, uh, I know you just finished Star Tours and I'm wondering if you'd like to come work on the tram tour. And I said, no, I have no interest in a tram tour. I have this alien encounter thing I want to play with for Disney. He said, okay, all right. And he walked out of my office, and five minutes later, the phone rang. It was Marty Sklar, and pulled me into his office, and he said, just help them for three weeks on the story for the tour, and then you can go back to the other show. I said, okay. So that turned into three years. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. And one of the things that happened really early on was a lot of it was set, so there was not a lot that could be changed. They had a tram, and they had a walking tour, and the cadence of every two and a half minutes, you moved, you moved, you moved. It was an, a, an interesting, challenging machine, I would say. And halfway through the project, I remember Marty Katz, who was head of production at the studio, said, in a big meeting on studio tour, he said, you know, we will never film a movie down here. And the whole premise of the production studio was that you were going to be filming movies there. So Michael Eisner uh, said, well, what we'll do is we'll put movies with movie stars on every one of the stops, and you'll think you saw a production film. <laughs> so out of nowhere, on the walking tour, we suddenly had to produce, I think, about eight, eight or ten, two and a half minute films. And, you know, great one with Bette Midler, The Lottery, my favorite probably, but they were all about how movies were made. And at the end of that project, um, I said to Marty, I said, okay, now I want to go back to this attraction thing that I want to play around with. He said, no, Jeffrey and I think you should set up a movie division at Imagineering. And I said, no, I think I'm going to do that. So it's awful with Marty Sklar. It's very hard to say no. And that started at the end of that summer. Um, we formed Theme Park Productions, and I did that for 20 years. I think we did about 400 different films, pre-shows, Circle Visions, 3D, you name it. But, and it was a path that I never thought would have existed, but it changed my life for two decades, for sure. Danny, you spent a bunch of time at the uh, Disney stores, and you were doing something quite different. How did that prepare you for them to make the segue over? Well, I was a, I started at the Disney stores as a senior carpenter, and this was the time when there was maybe, um, maybe like 18, 20 stores. So this was at the nation. How many were there at the height of it? At the height of it? Well, by the time I left, about a year and a half later, we had 100 stores. Okay. So we were rapidly designing, building, producing, going to the best malls of America, installing, and, and putting up these stores. Um, and I soon, you know, from a scenic carpenter, we started to outsource a lot of the production of it. So I just, I started designing and drawing and, and drafting the stores. Um, but, you know, retail is, is a little bit repetitive, and so I decided to, to try my hand at imaginary and started at probably the lowest, lowest level of, of, of a full-time employee. I was a show set intern uh, at the time. And, um, and just loved doing what I did. And I think that for me, what was really important and has kind of guided me in, in the 25 years I've been working for the company is, is that I just loved doing what I'm doing. And uh, which is a little bit different than um, do what you love, right? Uh -huh. It's love what you're doing. And when you love what you're doing, people want to work with you. They want to uh, offer you opportunities. Um, they want to make you part of their team. And they look after you. And I have 
many people here on the stage who looked after me. And they've, they've been my mentors and, and they've given me great opportunities. It's a really good point. And Kathy and I talked a little bit about leadership, and that's obviously something that all of you have your own theories about, but you constantly have to have teams of people follow you. How do you go about that, Kathy, and what, and what prepared you for that? Or was it over time? How did you know that you could be in charge of that many people going in the same place? Well, um, I probably started small with that, and that, that was probably just luck of the draw that I was working on small video productions at Disneyland, um, and then, then up at Imagineering, and started to get introduced to projects and project teams, and, and a particular project was um, in trouble with schedule and budget and, and finishing design, and that was Typhoon Lagoon, and, and so I sort of got plucked to go work on that as a producer. I never produced anything before, but I had shown you know, some sort of organizational ability to at least pull people together. And, and I think the, the thing that worked for me the best there and then led to bigger projects was you, you're exposed to things for the first time. You can't expect to walk in and know anything. It's the first time I'd ever been on a construction site. But you, you observe, you ask questions, Luckily, there are um, patient people who are more experienced that I think if they see you asking the questions and showing interest in trying, they work with you. I think that you know, the, the point was made earlier that if, if people like you, I mean, we are a team and we're a big team and, if, if, and we collaborate. And so no one is out there on their own. No one is hung out to dry. It, it is really the team works together and pulls together. And I think if you just have the right attitude and point of view and realize that you aren't doing it all yourself and you can't, you need these folks and you need them to do well and, and just orchestrate them. And I was thinking the other night, I know we're going to talk about this, that what the producer does, what the project manager does, what project leaders do is they take diverse people and sometimes diverse talents and skill sets and you orchestrate it. You're in the middle because you've got that end goal that you're all looking so it's just time and patience and good leaders and mentors. Joe, you, we talked a little bit about set designing and how you started. How did that evolve into, I've never met a person who is more specific about the environments that you create. How did set designing evolve into you doing that for these parks and Alani and that sort of thing? Um. Set design, theatrical set design, is um, a, a form of illusion where you almost always have this kind of distance between the viewer and what you're trying to do. But a lot of focus on what do they see from where they are, what do they think of what they are seeing from where they are looking back at what I'm putting out here. So on the one hand, um, as you move towards what we do now, that wall goes away. They're, they can touch this stuff, they can be right up on top of it, they're in and amidst it, so you lose a lot of um, illusionary capacity. So that's, on the one hand, I think you just have to up the game. On top of which, I believe, the information revolution ups the game for us. You used to be able to create simpler illusions because people knew less about everything because there was less information, now they know more. So you have all that on one side. The other side is the same, which is that, and I think I mentioned this before, any design of anything is not just the physical thing it is. It's also this package of emotions and ideas that it's trying to put out there. And as the environment gets richer, you're trying to make sure that even though you're adding detail, you're not adding superfluous detail, but the detail is pointed. It's still doing the same thing the simpler design would have done. All those additional details still have to do that. And then lastly, for me, the subject of animals, with Animal Kingdom, maybe a little bit with the Adventurous Club in the sense that we wanted people to believe that that stuff was real so they would be surprised when it acted like it was alive. Right? So it probably started there with this sense of, wow, this is kind of interesting. When you have stuff that really is real, it's really real. I mean, the African masks are real African masks, and we deliberately arrange them like, this stuff is real. That one's going to talk to you. Right? <laughs> like that. Um, and then with animals, it has to be real because the animals are real. So I fell into this aesthetic 
um, almost of necessity from the subject. Uh, but I find it to be really, really effective. And I think as long as you keep your eye on the ball, you can create a very rich environment that is not a distracting environment. But it is much more editorial than people probably imagine it is. Well, we're talking about details and excellence. And Joe, I would ask you, what drives, and what, when you wake up in the morning, you're thinking about working on one of the ships. What are you trying to do? What pushes you? Because I've been through the detail that you carry in your head, and it's pretty awesome. What gets you going, and what are you trying to accomplish there? I, I always default to what is going to be entertaining. You know, what is it about this space, this ride, whatever the experience is, that is going to have some emotional connection to the guests. And for me, that was a big challenge on the cruise ship because they were lounges and state rooms and you know, kids' spaces. Some were easier to find that emotional connection because like the kids' spaces, you could introduce Disney characters that, that come with all that kind of, people know who they are, what film they were in. And so it kind of does, you know, a lot of what we do is just about um, finding the trigger point, you know, because when we use existing IP, people already know that those characters and things. So that's that that part's always easier. Um, but I know I'm sure many of my colleagues here are the same thing. When when you give you're given something like a hotel or you're given something like a cruise ship, I mean we know. I mean part of it is understanding our brand. What people come to expect from the brand, they want to be entertained. And um, I think we've evolved to this place. We've got so much rich IP that's available to us, and it's great that we can mine all that. But for me, it's always about kind of boiling down the essence of what it is that people love about Disney. And I think it's the story, and it's having some emotional connection to it. So something like a lounge in a, in a, in a cruise ship. You know, first off, finding a story, like Joe says, you know, you've got to find that core, like dig deep and find what is that core story piece about it. And sometimes our stories are, are used as an area. Like Tom's making films, and that, that's an area. But sometimes our stories are more of a subtext for us as designers, we use the story to make choices. We push, we filter our choices through there, and then hopefully, the the when when it all comes out and the guests walk through, it becomes this cohesive piece, like a a, a French champagne bar. You know, we talked about you know as materials and the things that would be there. Um, maybe sometimes going as deep as creating characters that might have been the proprietor. Not that necessarily the guests are going to see it, but you talk about the characters and such, and then they become a filter too, that well, what would they do to you know create this kind of space? So bottom line thing is always about thinking about the entertainment piece of it. A number of you were performers when you were kids. Tom, how did that affect your career later by getting up on a stage and doing that kind of thing? Well, I, I was in a lot of community theater musicals and things as a kid. When did you start? How old were you? Uh, I, eight, maybe. Little kid. Um, and then moved on. But one of the things, this is in the, in the days before video, and so one of the things that was always challenging is if you were in a show, you never had to see the show. So if you were in The Music Man, you had no idea what the show was like. You'd ask your family and friends, what was it like? Was it good? Was it fun? And they'd say, yeah, but you couldn't, you know, you, you really wanted to be in the audience and be on the stage at the same time, get to watch it. And that was the thing, one of the things that really opened my eyes at the New York World's Fair was I thought, hey, these guys have created these shows, Carousel of Progress, Ford Magic Skyway, and Small World. They could climb in a boat or get in a car and see the show that they created with their family and friends. And it was such an interesting thing, this sort of mechanical theater. It's like, oh, that is really cool. I think that's a, it's, it's something that was so different and so new. And I still love that about what we do, you know, the ways that we look to convey people through our stories in interesting ways and um, the theatricality that we bring to it. All of that sort of harkens back to you know, those simple shows and the theater, the art of theater. We're just, you know, we're immersing you in a theatrical production that's three-dimensional um, where you can step on the stage. I was going to ask you, Eric, and this is a, a tough one, but what's the hardest part of your job? Um, probably working with Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. These jobs are very glamorous, I'm sure. You travel around all the time and stuff, but... No, I think, I, I think it's... Um, because I love Kathy, by the way. Um, that was, that was a, that was, you had to say uh, that I was going to come after. It was a smart hour. But anyway, um, so, but I, I think it's, it's um, for me, we're involved, all of us involved in so many things. And it's sort of, what is the priority? Because I I love the shiny object. This is just me personally. But I get distracted very easily by it. It goes back to my, I love detail. 
I mean, you know, I started in the model shop and I loved miniatures and all that kind of stuff before. It was figure finishing. I loved doing details on the present and stuff like that. So, so that's by nature is to go for the most fun, small thing. But then you have to step back and say, but that's not what's really driving all this. You have to keep the big thing going, not forgetting of that, but make sure that the priorities are balanced and that everything's getting the attention it needs to the degree it needs to that particular day. So I mean, I'm sure there's other things that you think of, but that's the first thing that came to my mind. Right. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask Joe, I've, I've been through a couple projects with you, and your sense of penetrating the entire process of a place, particularly the Alani, and I don't know how many of, how many of you have been to the Alani? Was there a we went through quite a cultural uh, experience, and I'd like for you to talk a little bit, Joe, about how you tried to create something that didn't exist anywhere else in the islands. Uh, okay. It, again, to me, has to do with this fundamental story basis upon which everything else is going to proceed. So in the case of Aulani, there's a really, really simple set of questions and answers. Like, Hawaii people, that's really far away. It's one of the furthest away from any place else places you can get to in the world. Why are you going to go there? What makes Hawaii worth going to? What gives Hawaii any identity that makes it different from St. Kitts or Baja California? Why Hawaii? And I believe that you very quickly, if you start just looking at the ads, realize what makes Hawaii Hawaii is Hawaiians. That's what makes Hawaii Hawaiians. Uh, Hawaii. So if what makes Hawaii Hawaii is Hawaiians, then it has to be about Hawaiians, right? It has to be about Hawaiians. And if it's about Hawaiians, guess what? I'm not Hawaiian. I mean, I've got Hawaiian cousins, but I'm not Hawaiian, right? So we're going to have to get, guess what? A whole bunch of Hawaiians. And, and who's going to say this thing is authentically Hawaiian? Are you going to say it? Am I going to say it? Who's going to say that? Hawaiian. And they're not going to say it. <laughs> Unless it's really Hawaiian. They're not going to say it because they don't like us and none of that, right? They say it because it's true. How's it going to be true? What's going to make it true? What's going to make it true is spending just a whole lot of time with these Hawaiians doing exactly what they say. So then you get to the challenge. What do we know about how to make a place that is enchanting and exciting and usable and livable and buildable that we can take what these guys want to say about what Hawaii is and make a place that is that? And if we do that, which nobody else has ever tried to do, not even tried to do, which I think is politically interesting, um, <laughs> Our hotel will not look like the other 115-story beachfront hotels in Hawaii because it just won't. So, and that's all planning. That's all you, those decisions. Those decisions are made in a month. That's done. And then the rest of it is carry this out. And of course, a lot of you have a subject like Hawaii and you have a culture like Disney. You have two things people think they know a lot about, right? And you're trying to change both of them. Mm -hmm. Trying to change what you think you know about Hawaii, none of that stuff is true. And what you think it is that makes this company Disney, much of that is not true. What we are is what we can do. What can we do with this story that we have never done before? What can we do with these people's story? Not our story, we don't own it, never will. What can we do? And these are simple questions and they're all up front and once you turn those knobs, a big machine starts to turn, and as soon as it knows where it's going, it does this incredible job. It's incredible. It's like a giant laser beam. You just point it, I swear to God, you could point this at anything in the world. I think you could point it at world hunger. Anything. And this whole thing goes, oh, oh, that's what we're trying to do, and away they go. And you got engineers, and artists, and designers, and writers, and business people, and they're all like working like crazy to do this thing, but you have to tell them what to do. Anyway, that was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> six incredible people here, and we don't want to just talk at you. I'm kind of curious to, to know what you'd like to ask of them. Any questions from anybody? Yes, sir. And I'll repeat it. Oh, we have mics here, I think. Okay. Oh, we're going to line up. Perfect. Okay, but you, you
you do yours first because you start. <laughs> and I'll read it. Uh, okay, his question is, there's some debate on this, but is Tom Fitzgerald a beach boy? We all so, <laughs> uh, yeah, there was a time at Imagineering uh, when we didn't hire actors for the films and things that were in the parks. And in the case of the Horizons attraction, there comes a time in, a, in the production when we have the model, the one-inch model, and the production people come in with these gigantic black notebooks and start to figure out how they're going to make the figures for the ride. And so they'll look at a scene and they'll go, the mother in the desert thing, uh, GE Mom Act 4. Okay, this person over there, uh, Grover Cleveland with the head of, you know, and they would put all these things together. And they got to the scene in Horizons that was the sub-boy scene, and they went, uh, 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 we don't have any teenagers. And Blaine Gibson, who is the master sculptor, said, well, we have, Tom will be our teenager. <laughs> you know, and you laugh and you say, okay, fine. And they're writing stuff and you go on. And then, sure enough, I come back from Ep the opening of Epcot and they say, you know, report to the studio. And I get to the studio and they're dressing me up as the sub boy and saying, you're going to be the sub boy. So they put a blonde wig on, and I couldn't stop laughing, so they said, okay, we won't do that. And then they had to get rid of it, even then there's some gray hair, and they said that. And then they put me on a soundstage um, with Norm Lenzer, who had written that, and I had to read this, you know, the lines, horribly, I think, and become a subboy. So I was, you know, talking to my girlfriend who worked in the desert farm, going, you know, late? Why would I be late? I'm like a human clock, which I'm not, by the way. I'm reminding of, I'm reminded of that concept. Anyway, those are the days where often they would pull Imagineers in. I think Jeff Burr uh, and Joe Rohde, I mean, many of us were, you could sort of look in the, the statues in American Adventure, or, you know, who was Bonnie Appetit modeled after, or there was a lot of that in those days. But thankfully, my performances ended many years ago in Horizons. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, I have a question. Uh, how was your experience in working on Tokyo Disneyland? Danny, do you want to take that? So the question is, how was my experience working with Tokyo Disneyland? And uh, what, you, what work did you did in the park? Or who, who would like to take that one? Well, for, I mean, I can start. So for <laughs> Tokyo, the first time I worked on Tokyo was back in in 98, 99, and that was for Pooh's Honey Hunt, um, which is a fantastic, fantastic uh, attraction. It was very innovative. We, it was the first time we had a, a trackless vehicle, um, and I just love the story. Um, and in working there, I, that's where I fell in love with Japan, and that's where actually I fell in love with my wife, who I met in Japan. And so, um, ever since then, I've had this love affair with Japan, and and was able to um, then work on the Pirates uh, enhancement, putting uh, Captain Jack Sparrow into the Pirates attraction over in Tokyo in 2007. Um, then was able to, with, with Joe asked me to live there um, for three, four years. And I was the uh, director of Walt Disney Imagineering in Japan for, for that time, um, and just loved every minute of it. Um, and then he called me back and asked him, and asked me if I would take over his job. So. <laughs> <laughs> he foolishly said yes. <laughs> Next question. Uh, so I was wondering what a daily schedule, or a, oh, I, I imagine it's sort of diverse, but you say creative lead. What does that mean? Are you, are you supervising uh, just a rundown of what a day or a week or... It changes depending on where you are in a project. So if you're at the front end of a project, you're doing conceptual development. That is a series of story sessions, meetings in various scales. Some people like to do huge brainstorming meetings with lots of people. Some people like to do smaller, maybe four to six person story meetings. You spend a lot of time figuring out what is it that we are trying to do. Research, study, learn what you need to learn, talk about what you're trying to do, get an idea together, small group of people. And at that stage, the day is very simply structured. As the team grows, if you are the leader, you're starting to spin off subgroups. So you empower a group to go look at this, empower a group to look at that, empower a group to look at this. Now you have two jobs. One is sort of to defend and protect, 
make sure that the project's going forward, make sure your people are okay, make sure you have the stuff you need to do the job, and the other is this kind of honeybee job of going, all right, is that working? You guys say, that's good, that's terrible, don't do that. Try this, you know, floating around like that. Um, and basically from then the job starts to split and split as it becomes more complex and you, you have the challenge of not falling into one of those vortexes and ending up being one of the people sitting in that room having those meetings. Because if that happens, there's nobody driving the ship and off it goes and you know, next thing you know, you're in the news tipped over. So that was a great question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Oh, oh gosh. Hi. <laughs> I'm sort of on an angle here. Question for Joe. Um, we're wondering about Disco Yeti and if it'll ever be fixed. Oh, I love that Yeti. Um, we, you have to understand, it's a giant, complicated machine sitting on top of like a 46-foot tall tower in the middle of a finished building. So, <laughs> it's really hard to fix, but we are working on it. Um, and we continue to work on it. Uh, we have tried several things. Uh, None of them quite get to the key turning of the 40-foot tower inside of a finished building, but we are working on it. And I personally, you know, kind of bulldog this one in a way that is, doesn't always make me popular, but I will fix the Yeti someday, I swear. personally vouch for the personal fact that I intend to try to see. <laughs> yes, sir. I hope that there's nobody in corporate Biz Disney here today because they're going to stone me. <laughs> I've been a premium pass holder for 12 years. I have been in the Disney cattle drive and seen my prices go up and up and up. I thought that the DNA that Disney put into this company was lost. I am convinced today that it lives on in you wow. and in Imagineering. Please don't ever let them take that away from you. Please. You know, I appreciate the Acknowledgement, and that's what we strive to do every day. So to be true to our fans and the fans of Disney. The thing you care about is what we actually get up every morning to do. Right. But uh -oh. there really are no evil monkeys out there. <laughs> <laughs> really not out there. The company is full of well-intentioned, hard-working people, all of whom, all of whom are trying to solve these problems. Tremendous, complex giant problems of delivering this product to these people for a money that keeps the shareholders in the whole giant thing. And you rarely, you see them once in a while come into the company ambitious, self-interested, selfish, greedy people. <laughs> and they do not laugh. No, they don't make it. They hate it here. They yeah. hate it here. Yeah. They hate it. And they are gone within very few years because they hate it because of what the company is really like. So while it may not always be able to achieve what we like to see it all achieve, because we all love it and think it's great, I promise you that all those people, that's what they are trying to do. You know, and something I would add to what Joe's saying is, um, when Pixar came into the Disney fold and John Lasseter came, who's a very good friend of mine, John loves Disney more than any 50 people I know. And he has a very big impact on the company. He influences a lot of the company. And as long as that man wakes up in the morning and comes to work, he makes Disney stronger in the kind of thing you're talking about. It, we are all trying to do the same thing. I sit in these story rooms at Pixar, you'd be amazed at the level of, of how we talk to each other. It is a tough room, you know, it, because we want Finding Nemo to be great. And you'd be amazed, and I, and I worked on a lot of live action movies, maybe a couple hundred. It was never like that. There's something about the, the Disney process, but now also informed by the Pixar process, that makes us stronger and makes us want to be better. So, that's a little commercial for you. It's kind of a 
two-part question. What's, for anybody on the panel, what's the most bizarre project ever pitched to you? <laughs> and then the second part would be, what is the most bizarre project that was ever pitched that worked? I, I'll start. Okay. It actually wasn't really a, a, a real project. I was um, judging, we have this thing called Imaginations, uh, which is a competition where school schools or groups of uh, students from various colleges can submit stuff. And I was locked in a room with some other Imagineers like for a week to judge this stuff. And the weirdest one was this, it was a box. And inside the box was a shipping tube and two bags of, um, of uh, I, I guess it was like some kind of jello, whipped creamy, viscous stuff, and a blindfold and a pillow. And, you, and the instructions were, and the, their idea was uh, to communicate like an alien. And they gave this instruction how you had to sit on the, on the, the cornflake filled pillow on one side, two people sitting across, and then just by putting the blindfold on and just by squeezing the tube full of this viscous stuff back and forth, communicate to each other. <laughs> of course, they didn't win, but I said, we should hire these guys. <laughs> so out there. Okay, what's the weirdest one that worked? Oh, well, that's oh. not, I've never, well, I know it's a little easier to understand, but it was, at, at some point, sort of going back to what the last guy was talking about, um, when we were talking about how can we do things for a tighter budget and get the, you know, just and do more simpler things that won't cost as much. Somebody came into the, to the pitch meeting and pitched an idea called the Lost World. They said you get in a boat and you go inside this building and it'd be really, really dark and be in this darkness for a long time and you'd come out and the narrator would say, well, I guess the world is still lost. <laughs> Dressed up as Las Vegas showgirl. <laughs> nice. This could be a whole separate panel, you really. Know? <laughs> yes, sir. I have a background in theater and computer science, and so I understand both sides of the equation. So my question is, what percentage of your jobs are artistic, and what percentage of right, your jobs right. are technical? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to take that? Oh, well, I think it changes day to day. Somebody else go. I talk to. I mean, it changes, like Joe was saying earlier, depending on what part of the process you're in, I think in the upfront piece, it's, very, it's almost pure creative, because that's when you're coming up with the big ideas and, and trying to form all the stories and such, and then as you get deeper and deeper into the project, and you're having to work with the specific disciplines to realize all those ideas, then it becomes more technical. Yeah, bear in mind, if you really take the word technical and extend it beyond computers, anything you intend to build is going to be technical at some degree, right? So if you're really talking about an interface between digital design and physical design or the arts and sciences, I think um, nowadays we are using digital tools very, very early. We are exploring these things and as soon as you start to use digital tools, you are carrying information. It's not just visual. There's all this other code that's tracking along with it. So the moment you have the ability to do that, to track potential cost, how much steel is really in that giant orange, you know, <laughs> uh, you have entered the realm of technical, right? So that is creeping forward in our process. Not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it greatly empowers our ability to understand the technical implications of a creative idea. Um, so I would say that it is moving forward, but not necessarily in a way that cramps our style. I was going to say, too, I think it would be unfair to our technical um, personnel at Imagineering to call them anything other than creative. We're all in the creative division, but our technical folks, like to Joe's point, we're, we're engaging them earlier and earlier, and they've got to be really creative engineers. Think about what we ask the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror to do. Think about what we ask the mountain at at Cars Land to do, it's not, many, not every day a structural engineer is asked to design a mountain and work with the, 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 the model builders and the dimensional, dimensional designers to help us tell our story. So they are as creative as any artist that we have out there. I, I, do, I do think we've crossed a line, maybe, I think we crossed it with Everest, where we're talking about building something you couldn't build without digitally native. And now we're just totally in that world where we talk about building things that are impossible to build 
unless you fuse these physics. I don't see any division between creativity and the technical side because we are problem solvers. We're always trying to solve problems, and in order to solve problems, you have to be creative. And so, whether it's by structural engineering, whether it's mechanical, whether it's ride architecture, or whether it's art. Oh, and in order to be creative, you have to understand the technical properties of the medium you're working in, right? I mean, if that's clay, you still have to understand what it can do. What clay does. I mean, I, I think it is, as I say, the moment you engage beyond imagination and step into creativity, you enter the realm of the technical. Um, and then what we've been doing because of digital means is pulling highly sophisticated technical means forward. We have time for one last question. Yes? Oh, oh, hi. Hi. I can't believe I'm talking to you all right now. But no <laughs> well, you um, actually are, so. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I, um, I've always kind of dreamed about being an Imagineer, and I was going to ask like a question kind of like and how to get there, but that's pretty much what this whole panel has kind of talked about. So. Um, Oh, by the way, Tom, when you mentioned uh, the whole Disney University thing, someone should work on that, and I would sign me up. I'm ready right now. Like, let's, let's go. Let's do that. Uh, my question is, um, do any of you have like a fondest memory from any of the projects that you worked on? Something that you you hold like really close to your heart? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Who would like to answer that one? Opening day. Every opening day we have is a is a happy, sad day, you know, you're letting go of something you just dreamt about in the middle of the night and worked on all day for five or more years. Um, those, those are, I think, are all really, really, there's nothing like seeing guests come and enjoy something that you've worked so hard on. It, it, it's, it's, it, it reaffirms what you've done, um, but at the same time, you sort of don't believe it until you see it. So for me, it would be any, any opening day we've, I've yeah. worked on. I was going to say exactly the same thing. The smiles on our guest faces experience the thing that we've worked so hard on and had so much fun doing. But, you know, it really is kind of this, it's, it's sort of Kathy alluded to, it's almost like you've, you've given birth to and raised a child, and now that child's going to go off to college, and other people are going to influence its life, and it's going to continue to, to grow and to, to uh, uh, create special memories for guests, but it was always your child. And, it's, and that's a bittersweet moment when you let go of it. But, we're all, but the great thing about Imagineering is we don't really let go. We still go back and improve and add and plus and, and uh, duplicate and do things like that to keep it alive and keep it part of our family. Right. Well, I'd like to thank you all. You were a great audience. And we'll, and I'll thank you for